Good morning. It's Tuesday and we're starting a brand new book today. The book of Philemon. I don't even know exactly how to pronounce it. Isn't that funny? After 20 years in ministry, I have never preached out of this book. I bet you haven't ever heard a sermon out of this book. If you have, I'd love to know what it is. Put it in the comments. What was it related to? It's going to be fun. Actually, um, I was doing the notes yesterday and thought this is It's really amazing. It's going to address some of the things we've been talking about here in Amplified for quite a while, Um, and you'll see why in just a few minutes. Hi, Cindy. Good to see you. Cindy, you're the first responder today. I like that. Good to see you. All right. Are you guys ready? Brand new book. If you're new to Amplified, welcome. We are so happy that you're here. I'll just say this before I jump into the scriptures. Um, I don't want this to be a sermon. I, I, that's not the intention of why we're gathered. We want this to be a Bible study. And what we figured out is that it's very possible to do Bible study online um, through Facebook Live because of the discussion. If you happen to be watching this outside of the live time, which is most of you, please know that I'm interested in what you got out of the scriptures, even if it's one sentence. You know, this was the one thing that stuck out to me. I love that. It, it helps keep this what it was designed to be, which is a discussion and not a sermon. So, um, hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Mom. Deborah Wynn. Hi, Tricia. Um, so, if you get something, um, even later, just type it in. It, it's great. It's The discussion is what helps kind of keep the word in us all day long. So please don't feel weird about that if you're not watching live. Yes? Hi, Imelda. All right, are you guys ready? Okay, thanks, Mom. She's listening today, but she will comment later. Maybe you're driving to work. Hi, Nicole. Good to see you. Okay, Philemon. Am I even saying that right? I don't know. Philemon, chapter one. Guess what? We're going to start and finish this book today because it's only one chapter. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Here we go. It says, this letter is from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Jesus Christ and from our brother Timothy. I'm writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister Apaphia, and to our fellow soldier Archippus, and to the church that meets in your house. <clears throat> may, God our <clears throat> excuse me. may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. And I'm praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That's why I'm boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do. But because of your love, I prefer simply to ask you, consider this a request from me, Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. All right, this is fascinating. This may be the most fascinating letter we have in in the New Testament because the other letters that we're we're reading from Paul are to uh, two young men, Timothy and Titus, Um, or to churches where he's addressing uh, things that are happening within that community, or he's addressing two young men who are in full-time ministry. This letter is addressed to a man named Onesimus. No, Philemon, sorry. Philemon, am I saying that right? Marsha will know. Somebody knows. Um, He's addressing this letter to Philemon. It looks as if Philemon seems to be the owner of a house where they're meeting, We can maybe infer from that that um, possibly he's wealthy. That's why that church is meeting there. It's big enough for a church, even a small church, to meet in. It's probably um, that. So Marcia's saying I'm saying it right. So we're looking at how he's addressing somebody who's technically under his leadership as an apostle, but this man is not really in full-time ministry the way we would think of it or maybe even the way Paul thought of it, about it. But what he was saying is, I know this... This church meets in your house, and he's uh, honoring him. He's saying, um, your generosity is wonderful. I'm praying even that your generosity will increase as you experience Christ more. Do you see that? And then he's 
beginning to make this this uh, favor, so to speak, known. And we're going to find out in a few minutes what it is, but I want to just point out to you this interesting line. We just read it. He says, I could demand this of you. How so, Paul? Well, because Paul's saying I'm an apostle over this church and I have authority over the workings of this church. But Paul's saying, I'm not wanting to demand it of you. I'm wanting to ask a favor and I'm drawing on your love, your love for me. And then Paul puts this thing out there where he says two things that I think are, I mean, they're just kind of interesting, right? He says, remember, I'm an old man, um, re- you know, and also remember, I'm in prison. I just said it at the beginning of the letter, but I'm going to say it again. He's going to say it a couple times in this letter. You know, my kids say this, especially Judah. Um, I was asking him the other day, well, something about superhero powers. We were talking about superhero powers. And I said, well, what do you think mine is? And when they were little, I used to tell them that I could fly, but I never did it in front of them because my arms were tired. And so they believed this for years and years. Uh, and they, they, you know, come up to me at, at different times and they, will you, will you do it now? Will you fly now? And I'd look around now. It'll probably f- freak that person out over there. I'll just wait. We'll do it later. And I'd always put it off. Well, more recently, as they've gotten older, we were talking about the same thing and joking. I said, well, what do you think my superpower is, Judah? And he said, guilt. You're a great guilter. <laughs> I really think, I mean, whatever. I'm sure people will have an, have an opinion about that. But I really think that's what Paul's starting to do in this letter, right? He's, he's saying, you know, here's the right thing. You know the right thing. Oh, I'm an old man. I can't, you know. And by the way, I'm in prison. I mean, he's, he is drawing on something here that's really unique and that we haven't really necessarily seen before. Welcome. I see new folks uh, joining in. Hi, I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Christiana. Yeah, isn't that funny, Marcia? I mean, it's just, it's just interesting, right? So let's keep going. Verse, um, verse 10. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus, Onesimus hasn't been much use to you in the past, but now he's very useful to both of us. I'm sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart here again. Here's this Paul. He is putting his name on this person called Onesimus. He's putting his name on this, on this man. He's, he's, he's uh, putting his, um, I don't know how else to say it, but his stamp on this man. We're still not quite sure who it is. We're not sure who he is. So we're going to keep reading verse 13. I wanted to keep him here with me while I'm in these chains for preaching the good news. And he would have helped me on your behalf, but I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He is no longer a slave to you. He's more than a slave, for he's a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Uh Uh-oh, okay, we're starting to see what's happening here. Onesimus is actually a runaway slave. He turns out to be Philemon's runaway slave. And while he's run away, he has apparently heard the gospel, received the gospel. He is even helping Paul while he's in the prison. Do you see this dynamic? And so Paul doesn't want Philemon to hear back probably that he's got his runaway slave and now there's going to be a big issue in the church. And so Paul is is saying he's been a help and he's even, I've, I've credited it to your account that he's here helping me, right? Um, you hear that language where Paul's saying he was, he was lost to you. Well, not really. He didn't get lost. He ran away. Yes. And so even that Paul is kind of, um, it's called shaping the argument as it were. He's, he's shaping it a bit and he's asking Philemon to receive Onesimus back without the penalty of what that would have been in that in that day in that hour which would have been very look the penalty I'm sending him back but receive him now not just as a slave but as a Christian brother I think it was Marcia who was talking about did I lose you forever are you back 
that was a long time for it to drop, so I'm hoping that it's, it's still connected. <clears throat> I'm going to wait for somebody to jump on and say, yeah, we can hear you, and I'll keep going. Yes, Elizabeth, you hear me? Back. Okay, that was really interesting. I don't think it's ever done that before. We'll see. That'll be interesting for those uh, watching later as I'm trying to navigate my phone. Okay, hi. Hey, guys, if you didn't go back from yesterday and read Diane Guinea's statement um, on yesterday's post about how what's happening in Northern Ireland and specifically how she's addressing that, um, it is so awesome. Go back and read her, her uh, comments from yesterday. I promise you're going to be encouraged. And it's what we were talking about exactly, right? Doing what we do, and we're going to even get into it in this letter, um, addressing injustices from all different points, all different perspectives based on, the, based on the season that we're in, but always doing it with respect. And in that place, we will always see fruitfulness. It's about moving in the opposite spirit deal thing we talked about yesterday. Where was I? Hmm. Uh, something about Onesimus not being a slave anymore. Now Paul is sending him back as a Christian brother. I think I was starting to say that Marcia was talking about this in her post uh, from a couple weeks ago. Marcia, you can jo join in and on this, but it was like, how awkward would this have been when you're dealing with, um, at the time, males and females who were not on um, equal footing, you've got slaves and, um, and masters in the same room, all having church, and God saying to this group of people that were really uh, on unequal footing in that day, and God is saying, and now you're one family, I've got no favorites. Uh, there's nobody here more favored than another person. I'm no respecter of persons. That would have been revolutionary talk then, and it's still revolutionary talk now. So, morning, Nina. So, in that, that's what we're looking at here, right? Paul is saying to Philemon, I'm sending back Onesimus. I don't want you to punish him. I want, to, I want you to know that he was working on your behalf, and, and I want you to receive him when he comes, not only to not punish, but I want you to do something more. I want you to receive him as a brother, right? Now, Paul's not saying that Onesimus doesn't need to go back to the station he was in. He was talking about that heart issue of receiving someone back. Really interesting. Verse 17. So, Paul continues, if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. And I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. Well, you just kind of did. Uh, yes, my brother, please do this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. This is, I think, the most fascinating thing we've ever seen in a letter, right? I mean, we've seen Paul writing to um, churches, the elders, the leadership. We've seen Paul write letters to his spiritual sons, those who are uh, he's sending out to help establish churches in other regions. But we've never seen this. And we've seen that side of Paul where he's kind of ruling with iron, right? This is the way it is. This, now he is speaking to a man who has a ton of respect in the community that he's in. He's speaking to a man who's hosting the church of that region. And Paul is doing something different. He's, he's not crashing down on him, though he says he could right? He could. I could make you do what's right. I could demand that you do what's right, but I'm going to do it another way. And just that line, I mean, anybody who has a Jewish mother, and I do, um, some of you have mothers in the same vein, right? And Paul's almost doing that. Uh, I want you to do this, and I'm not even going to mention that you owe me your very life, right? Why is Paul saying that? Because Paul must have been the one preaching the gospel when Philemon heard the word and gave his life to the Lord. And Paul is reminding him of that. Listen, if I happen to come and preach the gospel, you'd still be in your sins, brother. Remember that? So hear what I'm saying and treat him like a brother. Honor my word because you remember your love for me. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Anybody else here? You have mothers and fathers who I'm not even going to mention that, you know, 
I, you kicked my ribs for nine months in the womb. I do that. Um, let's keep going. Um, verse 23. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Aristarchus Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. May the grace... Oh, no, no, I missed a part. I missed a part. We got to go back. Verse 21. I'm confident as I write this letter that you will do what I ask and even more. One more thing. (laughs) This is awesome. Please prepare a guest room for me for I'm hoping that God will answer your prayers and let me return to you soon. This is like, it's seriously, it's Jewish parenting at its best, right? I'm sure you're going to do everything that I'm lying out. I'm sure that you're going to fulfill it all. Yes. But by the way, I'll be there to check up that you're doing what I'm saying. So prepare a room for me. I'm going to be there and I'm going to, I'm going to believe that God's going to answer your prayers that I'm going to come up and check up on you. It's, it's funny. It's, it's interesting, right? It's unique. It's, it's insight into, um, who Paul is and what the dynamic is of the day. Um, then he goes on, he wraps up the letter. He, he mentions again, I just read it. Uh, here's another man, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. It's that final reminder. I'm in prison and I'm in prison for preaching to people like you. And then he says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I think this letter is absolutely off the chains. Um, fascinating. Um, We talked over the last couple of weeks about just these injustices that for us in our day, 2000 years after these letters were written, you know, we have a different standard, right? We see men and women much more on a equal footing. Um, We see Jew and Gentile much more on equal footing, right? Some of the things that we read about, we go, ooh, that sounds like racism today, or ooh, that sounds like sexism today, or ooh, you know, what is Paul doing? How come Paul didn't speak into this injustice of his day called slavery, right? And what I want you to see is these guys were speaking into it. They, you know, they may not have been called to write that injustice. Remember what Paul's calling is. He's a missionary. He's a sent one. He's an apostle. He is going from region to region to region, basically until he's caught by the authorities. And uh, his job, his assignment from the Lord was not to um, speak into that culture and get that culture to line up with all things in regards to Judaism. In fact, he says, that no, that's not what I'm doing at all. His job was to go into culture after culture after culture and present Christ and Christ crucified, present the good news. And in that, as people's hearts changed, he was trusting that as your heart changes, as you are changed by the gospel, your culture will bend, your culture will bow, right? It's the heart first And then it's the culture. I've had the opportunity, some of you know this, to work with evangelist Reinhard Bonnke, who spent so many years, I mean, most of his life um, in Africa, believing for all of Africa to be saved. And I don't know exactly what the number's at today, but it's something like 74, 75 million people have given their life to the Lord through his ministry over the course of these 40 years. And Um, I had the honor to kind of hear about some of these things because when he was there, um, it was right at the height of apartheid. I mean, talk about just terrible. Some of the things that, um, you know, he's, he's dealing with and, and every time he'd go into a new region, you know, they'd want to interview him on whatever the political assignment was in that moment. You know, what candidate are you for? What, um, Um, just whatever, you know, and he would just say, I'm here to preach the gospel. 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 I mean, like a broken record. He never left that assignment. And I know, you know, for me, even I'm going, well, shouldn't you have said, shouldn't you address this thing? And, but he had an assignment, a very specific assignment from the Lord. And I think in some ways it's what Paul was, was saying, he's saying, my assignment is to preach Christ and Christ crucified. If I'm going to be right in front of somebody, I'll address that one thing. But 
my assignment. I need to stay within the boundaries and the parameters that the Lord set for me, not because I believe in some injustice, but because I know that the devil would like nothing more than to have me distracted on the political climate of the day. Um, and see, you know, I'm just saying for me personally, that's not where my line is. Um, but I understand it. I understand it. You know, one of the things that deeply impacted me was a story I heard that came out of World War II. Um, and this, as the story goes, this was the church in, um, I believe it was the church in Germany. And um, the train cars, they would pack them full of the Jewish people and, and many others, Polish people, lots of people. And they were, they were uh, putting them in the railroad cars to be uh, taken out of the city into what would be the concentration camps. And there was a church that had been built right alongside of the, the uh, railroad tracks. <clears throat> and as the passengers would come by that church and they'd be able to hear, they'd be able to see. It was right during their church service. And the pastors began to uh, tell the church parishioners, hey, sing louder, sing louder. They'd command them to sing louder so they didn't have to hear the people in the train cars screaming and crying out for help. And that story so impacted me. And I made up my mind when I heard that story. I, I am never going to do that. I am never going to uh, call for a worship movement or our church or whatever that looks like to sing louder so that we don't have to address the wrongs that are happening in our day. I mean, but that's something that the Lord placed on my heart. You know, I'm, I'm, he's giving me the boundaries of my assignment. Is that my main assignment? No. But when it's coming through my backyard and somebody's, you know, crying out, I'm not going to turn my head. What I'm trying to say here is we all have different assignments and I can respect what Paul was doing. I absolutely respect what Reinhard Bonnke is doing. Um, it's to see that when put right in the middle of this, this uh, issue, this injustice of slavery, what we don't see is Paul advocating slavery. And that was a question that came up. Um, what we don't see is Paul advocating this inequality between men and women. In fact, he references women, my fellow workers, Janiah, my fellow workers, Priscilla, uh, right? So he knows he can't right the wrong of that injustice. That's not the assignment God's given him, but the way he lives and the way he interacts with those who are either bound into slavery or those who are bound in inequality. He's honoring and he's speaking into it and he's saying on a personal level, I will not be an advocate for this and I'm asking you, uh, Philemon in this case, uh, I'm asking you um, to receive this man back as a brother. Yeah, I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome. It shows us that, um, it just shows us that even Paul had a boundary, a field boundary that the Lord had given him. And he was saying, Paul, you can't go outside of this, this boundary. It's going to be a distraction for you. And, and God is the one who sets our boundaries in ministry or anything else. Amen. What is Cindy saying? I see Anisimus is someone a slave to sin and now he's free because of Jesus. And Paul's telling Philemon, just as he is, was saved, so give an Anisimus favor. Absolutely. I think it's absolutely something we can see as, an, as, a, as a metaphor. But in this case, it's also absolutely the truth. He was absolutely a, sl a real slave. So it's both and, not either or. But Trisha saying, if you don't agree with it and turn your back on it, we're agreeing by not doing anything. Yeah, I, I can agree with that, right? Um, I get that. Marcia's saying, I think he's pretty shrewd. So their focus stays on Jesus and, and what he's done as opposed to their focus being distracted to a cause. I would happen to 100% agree with that. You know, when I was thinking about this um, last night, I, I was thinking about that story that Jesus tells about the Good Samaritan, right? You remember that story? It's, it, everybody knows that story, I think. Um, there's a man, a Samaritan. Um, no, let me start with the man who's in the field. He's been beaten. He's been robbed. He's been left for dead, Right? And Jesus tells a story. He tells of two religious people. One's a priest. One at a time, the, 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 the religious man sees him, crosses the road in order to avoid him, and keeps walking probably to his religious service to go worship the Lord. A second religious person, same thing, sees him, crosses the road as 
so that he can avoid what he's seeing, not deal with what he's seeing, and goes on to his religious service. The third was the Samaritan man, and uh, those of you who don't know, the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along, I mean, at all, at all. I mean, the Jews would actually, this is the interesting thing, rather than crossing through some Samaria, the Samaritan region, rather than crossing through it, they, crossing through, they would walk all the way around it. It would add a lot of time and mileage to their trip, but they did, it was like, we won't even walk through there. We so don't like you. We so disagree with you. And there's some, some interesting reasons why they did that. But that was their culture, the Jewish culture. So Jesus is giving this story about uh, to the Jews who would walk, do anything they could to cross the road, in other words, to avoid a Samaritan person lying there. Jesus is saying, now here's the good Samaritan. And he, he could have done the same thing. He could have crossed the road, right? It would have been an eye for an eye. He could have done that. But instead, he, he goes to the man who's beaten and bruised on the ground. And what does he do? He binds him up. He, he cleans him up. He gets him to a hotel where he can recover. He pays for the guy's stay so that he can recover. You know what I'm saying? And, and so here's this story. And I, I was thinking about this very story when Paul's doing what he's doing. You know, Paul... Um, had other religious services to do. He had other things he had to take care of, but he doesn't cross the road to avoid what's right in front of him. And I think that to me is the standard. It's the standard of, of how we're to live. We can't be active on every single injustice that comes our way. There's two, there's two, it keeps cutting out. So I'm hoping you're still there. There's too many injustices for us to be active on every single thing right? It's, it's, there's too many. So we, we are called by God to, to um, be faithful to whatever he's called us to do. But here's the point I'd like to make. When it's right in front of us, when it's right in front of us, we do not cross the road to avoid it ever. It doesn't matter what it is. We, we acknowledge that we are the we are the ones walking into this this scene to be representatives of Christ. Yeah, isn't that amazing, Jen? Saying it seems like a parallel with the word that says your gift makes room for you. Paul's gift and assignment to preach the gospel gave him room and influence to speak into lives with authority and um, respect because his preaching set people free. Philemon would listen and would listen and adhere to Paul's request because he respected upon what Paul had done for him in his life. You mean Philemon uh, would go back to his master? I'm assuming that's what you meant. Um, that Philemon would go back? Oh, no, I'm wrong. Philemon is the... Yes, yes. Philemon would listen because of Paul's request. Yes. And Paul's pulling out the stops, right? He's pulling out the stops. He's not demanding it, right? Because, even this. Why isn't he demanding it? Because he's going to move in the opposite spirit of slavery. Slavery is about the demand. You have to, you have to, you have to. You're not, you're not free, you're owned, right? And so Paul, in dealing with slavery, what does he do? He moves in the opposite spirit. Instead of making a demand, he, he asks a favor. Isn't that awesome? It's exactly what Diane was talking about yesterday from, from um, Titus chapter 3 about this moving in the opposite spirit thing. So good, so good, yes? So that's what I would say. How do we apply this particular letter for our lives today, right? Nobody here is a slave. Nobody here owns a slave. Nobody here is advocating slavery, right? So how do we apply this letter today? I mean, I'm sure there's lots of op applications. I would love to hear what you're getting from it. For me, my biggest takeaway from this letter is to say, okay, today after I end this with you, I'm going to start homeschooling my kids. Um, you know, to be aware as we're doing what we're doing in life, that whatever God decides to put in my path for that day, whether it comes through Facebook, whether it comes, right, that we do our best to um, honor God by speaking into what's right in front of us today. Yes. What Sean's saying, great perspective. Paul did not advocate slavery either, right? One of the hardest things is somewhat of an apologist of the gospel 
is communicating how scriptures have been twisted to justify slavery in America. We, like Paul, have to trust that the Holy Spirit will do the work. It's a unique balance that we have to trust the Lord's leading. Yeah, I... Exactly. And you're such a, a an incredible um, mouthpiece, really, for God because of the way you see God and the way you speak into social injustices in this hour. If you have not heard Sean Welcome's um, poetry, even on Amplified, go back to old videos of Amplified or a few weeks ago and pull them up. Sean, if you can, I'd love for the, these guys to hear your newest poem or the newest poem I've heard. <clears throat> on the orange blossoms. Sean write, writes a poem about the injustices of our day. Our church is seated, seated on a road called Orange Blossom Trail in Orlando. And yet um, it is known for, to being the uh, red light district of Orlando. I mean, it's where all the prostitutes are, all the, um, um, gosh, I can't even think of the word now. Strip clubs are all on our street. Um, Diane saying she loved your poem. He just wrote a poem um, about this injustice and God writing this injustice. And there was a woman he had used uh, to speak to her uh, background of sex trafficking. She's come out of sex trafficking. And so he met with her and interviewed her and um, really wrote a poem about this woman and the story of her life and God's redemption of her life. And we just did a service about this whole thing. And that woman came and spoke at our church. It was so awesome, right? I mean, there, here's my point. When it's in front of you, when God provokes you, um, even if it's not your thing, give yourself to the Lord in that way, right? Um, Diane's, test, Diane's testimony of how she gives herself to the Lord, even, even investing and in stewarding her children, her, her most, her, I'm sure, her most loved ones on the whole earth. And yet she's making way for God to use her children in such an incredible way. Guys, this is what we're called to do as Christians. So let's not be the people who cross the road to avoid what's in front of us, whatever in front of us is. Yes, let's be diligent. Let's be light, as Elizabeth just said, wherever we go. Yep. Drug dealers, pimps, yes, Cindy's rem reminding me what's on OBT, yes, <laughs> yes. So wherever you are today, whether it's in Walmart, whether, whatever you're doing, grocery shopping, if you see something, if God allows you to see something, a lot of stuff, we're just going through life we don't see, but when we see something, you need to believe that God's allowing you to see that for a purpose. And when, when you see something, you just begin to say, Lord, what, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? Yes. And allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you in such a way. God will use your life in profound ways. If you ask him, what do you want me to do? He'll, he'll tell you. You'll, you'll see some of the um, most profound things in your life um, aren't planned. It's that burning bush. And Moses saw the burning bush. It's when we're able to see and we step into that seeing. Yes. And God will many times um, reveal himself in such incredible ways through healing, laying on of hands, through praying. Uh, somebody will say, uh, many times when I've done stuff like this, you know, that person will say, wow, I was just, you know, I was just about to kill myself. I mean, it can be so dramatic. And I was just saying the Lord, if you love me, if I'm supposed to live, send somebody over who would say something to me. And I mean, you're the one, you're the one God's sending. And I wonder how many people, you know, saw and he, we're even provoked, but we were just too busy. We crossed the road, right? I, I wonder how many opportunities I've missed because I'm just too, too busy and I just keep walking, right? Let's not miss. Let's not miss what God's put in front of us today and tomorrow and the next day. Amen? Uh, Elizabeth saying, let Christ break down the barriers of all the fallen world, but all we have to do is show up and ask. Amen. Trisha saying, let your light shine before men. David saying, having confidence in thy obedience, I woke unto thee, knowing that that will also do more than I say. Um, Diane saying, this is so good. Nina saying, just like football players are representative to the NFL, we are representatives of Christ. Ooh, I hadn't thought of it that way. Yes, I'm feeling, you know, almost athletic. Almost. I sure love you guys. Great morning. Great time with you. Tomorrow we're going to be starting. This is going to be so exciting. The book of Hebrews, we will start tomorrow. Um, Hebrews 
gets into some good stuff. A lot of um, a lot of sermons, a lot of messages come out of the book of, of Hebrews because it's so rich in God. It's so rich. So I hope you enjoyed today. I really did. And I love you guys, and I will see you tomorrow. Can't wait to hear what you're saying. Discuss, discuss. Bye.